Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Lise Grande. I'm the head of the United States Institute of Peace, which was established by the U.S. Congress in 1984 as a public nonpartisan institute dedicated to helping prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict abroad. It's a great honor to welcome Senator Peter Welch to USIP for a discussion on conflict in the world and the role that the United States plays in an era of growing strategic rivalry. There are a lot of dark clouds on the global horizon. Democratic stagnation and authoritarianism is spreading, impacting areas as diverse as the Western Balkans and Central America. Conflict has erupted in the Middle East. There have been a rash of coups in coastal West Africa and tensions in the South China Sea are rising, risking possible confrontation between the world's superpowers. The death and destruction of the wars in Ukraine, Israel and Gaza, Sudan, to name only the ones that are most often in our headlines, are a terrible and terrifying indictment of our collective global failure to promote justice, address our shared priorities, build prosperity, and resolve our grievances. USIP's Newsmaker Series is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to hear the views of our country's elected leaders and representatives who established this institute 40 years ago on the issues that matter the most for US national security. It's a privilege to have Senator Welsh with us for this Newsmaker Series. Before being elected senator from Vermont in 2022, Senator Welsh served 16 years of service in the U.S. House of Representatives, including multiple terms on the House Intelligence Committee and as a member of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. The senator who took the revered seat of Patrick Leahy serves as a member of the Senate Committee on the Judiciary, <coughs> on the Committees of Commerce, Agriculture, Rules, and the Joint Economic Committee. In these roles, Senator you have been a strong advocate for diplomacy, international human rights, and the need for clear-eyed American leadership abroad. Senator, may we offer the floor to you for opening comments? Um, thank you so much. Yes, I re really, really uh, good to be here. I uh, think you're a master of understatement that uh, things are tense now, <laughs> right? Ukraine, I mean, Gaza, Israel, which we'll be talking about, uh, America's role in the world, the uh, real threat to democracy that we're seeing uh, around the world and, and, and here as well. Uh, but I just want to say a couple of personal things. Uh, first of all, uh, it's really a thrill for me to be here. Uh, our family uh, has a tradition in the State Department. My father-in-law, who died, was, in, was a full-time uh, career Foreign Service person. He died in service uh, when he was in the Philippines as a young man at uh, 49. His name is over uh, in uh, the building on the wall. My niece is here, Lucy Seifarth, who's foreign career Foreign Service. And Lucy, it's wonderful to see you. Um, and I was saying when I came in, I was thrilled to see uh, uh, folks waiting for me, including some people we were grilling on the uh, House Intelligence Committee during the Russia <laughs> investigation. Ambassador, it's so good to see you. And what I was saying, and I just mean this from the bottom of my heart, because I think it's important for you to understand it, those of you who've committed yourself to this diplomatic effort to make the world a better place. Um, it was so wonderful for me to have people like Ambassador Taylor, Ambassador Hill, who came in and testified and conveyed a sense of confidence about the commitment good people had to serving an institution and the institutional values that we each have an obligation to carry on if we're part of, say, the State Department. Uh, what are the long-term interests that we have as a country to uh, stand up for democracy, to create opportunity, to resist oppression, but to do it in ways uh, through diplomacy that can actually make a difference? So it was a real thrill for me because that was very much, uh, that's a very much a conflict now in our own country. Um, and now that I'm in the Senate and um, am filling the seat of like, really a giant in the Senate, Patrick Leahy, uh, who did so much for human rights over the years. Uh, and by the way, just a little story. Uh, when I first went to Vermont, the first year I was there, there was a young man named Patrick Leahy who was running for the US Senate. 
And uh, I was a volunteer in his campaign in Windsor County uh, and delivered White River Junction, uh, Vermont, <laughs> for Patrick <laughs> Leahy. <laughs> this is a true story. In 48 years later, uh, when I got sworn in, it was Patrick Leahy walking me down the aisle. So nice little, <laughs> nice little Vermont story. But my hope is to be able to uh, carry on uh, his commitment to human rights and uh, somebody who is 30, over 30 years working with him. Uh, Tim Reeser is working with Amanda and me uh, on foreign policy right now. Um, you know, we're going to talk about things with questions, so I won't go into that. But I really do just want to renew the importance of the work that you do and the commitment you have, because it's not just that you're doing the work. You're, you're acknowledging that we have to have institutions that can actually be resourced. They can be staffed by people who have deep knowledge of, as a result of their commitment and their hard work. And even in times when uh, it becomes a political football and you become a political punching bag, because that does happen, as we've seen, uh, the professionalism that I saw of people who've committed their lives uh, to this work has been really inspiring for me and for many of my colleagues. Uh, so I, I just want to uh, start out by acknowledging the appreciation I have. And by the way, you have an amazing career too. Running around Yemen, the empty quarter, all these places that she's been, thank you so much. Senator, thank you for your kind and very gracious words to us. And with your permission, we would like to start exploring some of the okay. themes and issues that we've touched on. Yeah. Starting first with the Western Balkans, which I understand you recently visited. We know that it's a region which the United States has been heavily engaged in a quarter of a century ago. What we're interested in is what motivated you now, where the U.S. has been less engaged, to go back to that region and why do you think it matters for the U.S. in this context today? Well, there, you know, there's two things. The Western Balkans is a, a vivid example of where diplomacy saved lives, right? There was the siege of Sarajevo. Uh, there was a horror in Srebrenica. And it was insoluble. There was enormous ethnic conflict. And there was not just a violence as a tool of war. There was a violence uh, really as a political <coughs> means to wipe out anyone who was dissenting or was other than who you were. And uh, there's been a long history of involvement uh, of the US, of course, with the Dayton Accords, where that it was a triumph of democracy as a result in diplomacy uh, that did save lives. And there's been a history in the Senate of exceptional members of the Senate, like Bob Dole, uh, like uh, George Voinovich, uh, and now recently, Gene Shaheen, who want to make certain that we don't squander or let slip away the achievements of the Dayton Accords. And what you know in your work as diplomats is that the work's never done, okay? You have the Dayton Accords, it's signed, but then that next stage of hard work begins, the implementation. And even as the implementation goes on, there are stresses in uh, uh, pulling and tugging here and there in what is now resurrecting itself is some of the ethnic tensions that you're seeing uh, with the Republic of Srpska, uh, with the pressure in Kosovo, uh, with whether there's enough of the uh, U4, uh, the, the European force, to be engaged to make certain you tamp down uh, on the potential escalation of ethnic tensions. Um, so Senator Shaheen is all in on maintaining that tradition uh, of her predecessors. And um, I'm smart enough as a new senator to know that when I find a good woman, I'm going to tag along, right? <laughs> so I want to be involved with her uh, because I think that that focus of making certain that we don't let slip away the achievements of the Dayton Accords doesn't slip away. Uh, and while we have these incredible challenges with Ukraine and incredible challenges with, uh, with uh, Israel and Gaza in the Middle East, we can't forget to pay attention to other parts of the world where with the Russian influence there, uh, there's a potential for escalation. Uh, that would be really catastrophic for the lives of the people who live there, but also for our place in the world. 
So that was the point of our going there. And we went to North Macedonia, we went to Kosovo, uh, we went to Bosnia, uh, Herzegovina, uh, and uh, it was really quite moving for me to be in Sarajevo and to be um, in, in Srebrenica where we met with some of the mothers uh, whose sons and husbands were killed. And you know, you see this because you get around the world and you see where horror has happened and you commit yourself to trying to uh, end it and make durable peace. And that is really something that, as I mentioned, the work's never done. Uh, uh, so I hope to continue to work with Senator Shaheen and other colleagues to do all we can to make certain that the, 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 the achievements of Dayton are durable and that we resist this Russian influence that's trying to play on uh, those ethnic tensions that are still there. Mr. Senator, you've touched on something about the prioritization that the U.S. finds itself having to make. When we were the world superpower, there was scope for us to be involved in many different aspects of diplomacy and conflict resolution around the world. But as other powers are growing in strength and the demands on our attention, the demands on our resources are growing, <coughs> maybe we can't still play that same role. How do you suggest that the U.S. prioritizes the areas that we must continue to be involved in and those that our allies should take the lead in? Well, first of all, there's a threshold question here about whether the U.S. continues to accept its role uh, as a leader in international affairs. That's a debated proposition right now. In, you know, we're very much involved in Ukraine. I'm very supportive of what we're doing in Ukraine, and there is now a, a political pushback on whether we should continue to support Ukraine aid. So the threshold question for us <clears throat> is, does the United States have a role to play, and should it continue uh, on, because of its own place, uh, with its unique uh, ability to project power, uh, with the American story that we still believe in, about democracy, about human rights, uh, obviously laden with contradictions, laden with coming up short at various times, a history of our own where we don't all, all we stand up and, and meet the goals that we have. Uh, the, oh, those of us in this room, I think, are all committed to the worthwhile importance of trying to maintain that. Second, spheres of influence, um, you know, that's really, a con there, there, there's a couple of things happening. Uh, obviously, Russia is a very vivid example of where there's an emergence uh, of a t literally denying the sovereignty of a country and using force to achieve a pretty revanchist goal. And do you, do you give a pass to that or not? And that, again, I think is an example of good American leadership because we did not act alone. We used our capacity uh, as the central Western country to work with allies to create a collective response to what that the Russian invasion was. My view, we've got to maintain that. Uh, the other thing is that and how do we be involved? Is it hopefully not militarily everywhere? I mean, you're asking that question about where we're involved, where we take the lead. Where we hopefully can be involved is as many places as we can where we can effectively help promote uh, democracy and economic um, improvement. Um, Mr. Senator, you've mentioned now several times the terrible crisis in Israel and Gaza. Very difficult issue. Israelis have been subjected to murderous violence. Many leaders have singled out the Hamas attack as the most lethal of its kind in modern Israeli right. history. In Gaza, experts affirm the Palestinian death toll at well over 10,000, well over. The destruction is horrendous and both continue after the expiration of the humanitarian ceasefire. Right. The death, the casualties, and the destruction. How do we move forward? And is it even possible? <coughs> um, what Hamas did was so horrendous and unspeakable. Uh, you know, that 
killing and slaughter of kids, uh, civilians in, in the south of Israel. And by the way, a lot of the Israelis who were killed were many of the Israelis who had very close relationship with a lot of the Palestinians. There was an exquisite cruelty to what Hamas did. Uh, and I've been to Starot a couple of times uh, and met with a lot of Israelis there who were very much part of the peace movement there. So it's, it's just horrendous what Hamas did. Um, and totally understandable uh, that you have a, a view in Israel that you can't have Hamas, uh, obviously, as a partner. So the response uh, with military force was totally understandable. Uh, because, and by the way, one of the things I had to do was I felt it was an obligation was to watch that horrible video uh, that the IDF put together, and it was from some Hamas body cams. Can you imagine that? While well, you're doing this violence, you actually want to record it. It's really terrible. And then some videos in homes, and it's it, your heart breaks. Okay. So there's a right of self-defense, and Israel is right to be able to use that. There's another principle, and that is civilians uh, can't be part of the military. They, they can't, you've got to spare civilian lives as much as humanly possible. Uh, the bombing campaign does not do that. I mean, when you have bombing, and it's in one of the most densely populated uh, parts of the world, it, it, there's, not, there's no way you're not going to have thousands of civilian casualties, and that's happened. And that's the humanitarian catastrophe. So what's, how do you get out, how do you, how do you resolve this? Uh, and I don't see how you resolve it with the current uh, plan. The bombing occurred, there's been over 15,000 people who've been killed, there's a million point seven or more people who've been displaced. Uh, there's rubble in, uh, in Gaza City, uh, the bombing continues, you're gonna see more of that. And then there's a real worry that uh, that in addition to the casualties directly associated with the bombing, uh, this obviously interferes with humanitarian relief, but you're going to have the potential for more people to start to die, to die from disease. So I think there's got to be a question about the efficacy of this as a strategy. Uh, my view, the bombing should stop, okay? Because uh, it's not going to result in any good coming out of it. I mean, eventually what's going to happen uh, is at some point I think Israel will decide that they've degraded Hamas sufficiently to assure the safety of, of their citizens, and that is Israel's obligation, and put a, 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 a perimeter around Gaza and have their troops back uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the area of Gaza to make certain that it's not possible for there to be another attack on their people. But in the long run, what we know is what we've always known. There has to be a commitment to a two-state solution. And what's happening now in Gaza uh, is also, uh, there's bad things happening in the West Bank as well, uh, where uh, there continues to be IDF. Uh, a, 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 a lot of West Bank uh, Palestinians are, 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 are getting killed. So we know we have to get to the serious negotiations on a two-state solution. The frustration for, I think, a lot of us is that on October 6th, Israel was in a pretty strong position with its, with its neighbors. When you think back to 1973 and all these countries that wanted to annihilate Israel are now uh, having normalized relationships with Israel, Israel was in a pretty solid position uh, with, its, with its neighbors, and that's a really good thing. But its problems were on the West Bank, and its problems obviously were in Gaza. And of course, you had a government in Israel that uh, was having incredible uh, protest among its own people about what was perceived as an overreach on the part of the Netanyahu government with respect to the Supreme Court. <clears throat> and now, of course, there's unity in Israel uh, because they're united in their grief and their determination to make sure that they protect them, their, their, own, their fellow citizens. But we've got to get back to that two-state solution. It's going to require an Israeli government that is genuinely committed to it. And it's also going to require active, active, active engagement uh, by some of the Arab states. Uh, this, is, this can be a huge role for the United States of America to be the convener 
Uh, but there's going to have to be uh, Arab states that have been in the process of normalizing their relationships with Israel to play a constructive role. And obviously any outcome long term can include a Hamas uh, philosophy that's uh, committed to the destruction of Israel and killing Jews. So not easy, but what I see is not at all a, a long run effective is uh, bombing our way to some kind of durable long term outcome. Um, Mr. Senator, one of the truly remarkable achievements of the period since the end of the Second World War, and very much the period of Pax Americana from the end of the Cold War, was the reestablishment of the distinction, you mentioned this, between a combatant and a non-combatant during warfare. Right. Much of the leadership in establishing the laws of warfare and the norms that militaries, including ours and our allies, but many others, adhere to, it was a singular American achievement. Mm -hmm. We led that process. We helped to define it. We created many of the institutions that have made that a reality. When you look at the wars you see now, the context in Israel and then Gaza, other wars, do you still feel that America takes pride in that achievement and responsibility for encouraging our allies and all others to adhere to those? Well. You know, I hadn't thought a lot about that, but here's what we know. Uh, it's the importance of institutions, but there's another reality here. If a country gets attacked like we did in 9-11, as Israel did uh, on October 7th, uh, norms are self-protection uh, is first. Protecting your own citizens is first and, and uh, whatever the rules are, are second. So as much as it is really important for us to be promoting the norms and protecting civilians and having rules of engagement, let's not be any, under any illusion that a country that suffers a 9-11 or an October 7th is going to be spending a lot of time other than on how do we protect our citizens. And oftentimes, as we did, in my view, in 9-11, Overreacted. I mean, we invaded Iraq. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to even imagine that that's what we did after 9/11, since Iraq had nothing to do with what happened in 9/11. But there it was an enormous internal pressure from citizens to take a, a definitive action that often gets associated with military work. But this is why the work that you do here, USIP, and the work we do as diplomats is about preventing things like this from happening, mm -hmm. all right? You know, it's looking over the horizon and realizing that you don't know when or how, but you know that if you let grievances fester, you don't make progress on acknowledging the legitimate aspirations uh, of people in a society, that ultimately that can lead to, uh, it, it can lead to conflict, it can lead to widespread loss of life. Uh, so. For me, yes, let's have these rules of engagement. Uh, there are standards and norms. The UN, the US, EU, we do our best to adhere to them in their guidelines. But also let's not forget that the really important work is looking over the horizon and taking steps today uh, to, and I'll give just an example, maintain the progress we made in the Dayton Accords. And it's, it, you know, we have to do that kind of work quietly, but that's going to be true in the Middle East with Gaza and Israel. Somehow, some way, this is going to end at some point, the, the, the bombing and the, the violence, but it won't end and be durable unless we actually do the hard diplomatic work of getting to that two-state solution. Mr. Senator, Americans seem split on whether and to what extent the United States should continue to support Ukraine in its war against Russian aggression. You've come down very strongly and clearly in favor of continuing American assistance to Ukraine. In your view, what is at stake in this war? The, the, the world order, the post-World uh, World War II order, uh, where uh, uh, you don't uh, use force to uh, take territory from a sovereign country. Uh, and the rules of diplomatic 
engagement as opposed to the rules of military engagement. That's really what's at stake. Uh, and uh, you know, I have confidence that we're going to get there. Uh, there's a, it's, there's a battle brewing now, obviously in the in the in the House and in the Senate about this. Uh, but there's a very there continues to be very strong bipartisan support. I mean, Senator McConnell is very very strong uh, and eloquent uh, in his defense of U.S. continued engagement uh, with Ukraine. Uh, what's going to be happening this week? Uh, in the next week is the question of the border, which is always a very, very tough political issue, getting conjoined with uh, Israeli aid and getting conjoined uh, with Ukraine aid. Um, so uh, it's not a pretty situation to watch over in Capitol Hill most of the time, even when things are going well. Uh, but I think somehow, some way, we'll get to where we need to be on this. Uh, Mr. Senator, you've mentioned Republican colleagues that you share a common sense of purpose with and a yeah. common commitment to solve problems. When you watch the news in America, you might come to the impression that examples of that are few and far between. Do you still see bipartisanship as one of the bedrock pillars of our foreign policy and national security, or do you wish it to be a pillar? You know, I've never seen a problem that gets resolved without working with people you disagree with. So, you know, bipartisanship uh, is essential to have durable resolutions. And that requires give and take, obviously. You know, I was the Senate president uh, in Vermont. And uh, I, I, we, had a, we had a majority. And I appointed uh, three Republicans to chair committees. And when I've told people down here, my colleagues, when I was in the House that I did that, they literally thought I needed a mental status exam. All right, and then they accused me of being a good guy. <laughs> and that's why I did it. And I denied that accusation. <laughs> I, I said, this had nothing to do with being a good guy. We had some good Republicans that wanted to get make progress. They were on these committees. We were the majority, but they felt they had a real input. They did have real input, and it actually helped uh, pull us back from over-exuberance, I'll say. So that when we passed like a health care bill, then the next question was, what did we get wrong, and how do we make it right, or how can we make it better? It wasn't, let, let's repeal it. And that's what happened down here with Obamacare. Remember, we passed it, but then we went through a repeal effort with 60, I think, eight votes. So the the... We share problems, the challenges, when we don't share norms. And what has been so much of a challenge, I think, for all of us, and it certainly is the, the heartbreak I had on January 6th, was that really sacred and absolutely essential democratic norm of respecting the outcome of an election, the voters decide, that was challenged. And it was so shocking to me that I was in the building, I was in the gallery, it was the actually the worst place to be. And as I heard the shot fired, as the uh, folks outside were battering the door down, and I was scared, along with my colleagues, but I didn't believe it was happening. I was saying, Peter, this can't be happening. It's the United States of America, we just had an election. So that's what's been so destabilizing, I think, for so many of us, that these norms that we accepted that would be a restraining influence on us and on others with whom we disagreed, they, those have been challenged. And that's, you know, my view is that for a society to be successful, you need norms, even more than, even as much as, or more than a constitution, because one of the norms that got shattered was the constitution didn't matter. Um, and. Uh, uh, and you need institutions, and both are under assault. So all of us who believe that those are essential components of our well-being uh, have to ex exercise our responsibility to do all we can for the preservation of norms and for the, and the, and for the vitality of our institutions. Mr. Senator, we see a trend toward authoritarianism in many parts of the world, including in our own near mm -hmm. abroad in Central and South America. You've spoken in the past uh, about the importance of protecting democracy around the world. Can you share your thoughts on how support for democracy advances global stability and peace? Well, 
My biggest advocacy for democracy is that it is a means of resolving conflicts that invites all who are affected by the outcome to have a seat at the table. And if everybody has a seat at the table, there's a profound respect for the aspirations of everybody in a complicated society. And it requires a certain amount of humility and a certain amount of acceptance of limitations. Uh, and it, in my view, when you have a society where there's a bedrock of respect that people you disagree with but who have legitimate aspirations as you do, and that through engagement you can come to resolutions that allow for common progress and shared progress, that that's a better way to live. It's a better way ultimately uh, to have peace because there's some confidence that this process allows you to be heard uh, and ultimately to be successful. And it includes in a democratic process that if you lose an election, you know, you fight another day. Now, in an authoritarian approach, obviously, it's about suppressing aspirations. It's about being in charge. It's my way. Uh, and that's even before it gets into the ego-driven, you know, self-enrichment uh, and total disregard and definition of people you disagree with as other, less worthy, and ultimately dispensable. So uh, that's what it, we aspire to in this country. And, you know, we have such a, a – in, in the challenge for us is to live up to that ideal. Uh, from one generation to another. And as I was saying about something else, that work is never done. But it's as stressful for us now as it's ever been. I do believe that. Mm. Mr. Senator, before your final wrap-up comments, may we ask you one last question about climate? Because many would argue that if you look at all of the threats to global stability, perhaps the single greatest threat in the longer term is climate change. Um, how do you view this challenge, and what do you think America's role should be in addressing it? Well, two things. Number one, I actually think maintaining our democratic form of government is the most important in having democracy, because that is going to be the tool that we need in order to address the incredibly demanding challenges of moving from a carbon-based energy system mm -hmm. to uh, a, 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 a clean energy system. All right, So democracy is a key here as the tool. But secondly, uh, climate change is, I mean, there's no more debate about it, right, about whether it's real or not. We were having that debate for a long time uh, about whether the science was real or it wasn't. And I actually think that was just a cover for apprehension that people had about what the impact was of having to move from uh, a carbon-based economy to a clean energy-based economy. The challenges are real, and we can acknowledge that. But what, if we're engaged, and we're starting to, um, then there's opportunity in a confident society where you acknowledge what the challenges are. A confident society doesn't deny them. It, it takes on the challenges, right? Mm -hmm. It starts using its technology to create clean energy. It starts using its technology for battery storage. It starts uh, setting up systems to make the transition for folks in coal country who are impacted. And by the way, we've got to acknowledge that, right? That's tough. If you've been a three or four generation coal mining family and you've kept the lights on in Vermont, you've done, you've done God's work for folks in Vermont. So a part of our move towards dealing with uh, what is catastrophic, if, if we don't stop it, uh, has to be an acknowledgement that their transition is disruptive. Uh, and, and, and we've got to do it. That's our work. And what I see that is exciting for me is young people have that confidence uh, that we can take it on. We can do it, and we have to. Um, Senator, we're at the end of our 30 minutes. May we invite you for closing reflections, comments, guidance, guidance. to the Institute? What would you like to see us do? You know, it, it, I'm going to go back to where I began. Um, is the day-to-day -day work that one does as a diplomat one does as a uh, senator uh, or politician. Um, a lot of mundane stuff. <laughs> Phone calls, 
papers, reading, uh, calling that person back. Uh, <laughs> Uh, looking the other way when somebody you know slights you, uh, it's the day-to-day -day, uh, chores of getting anything done. But when you I occasionally take that half step back, um, in you have the opportunity to see uh, how important it is, because I'll go to the Dayton Accords. That saved lives. And it's been saving lives for years. And even as the ink is being dried on the signatures, the work is never done. But when you step back at that moment and you see that all that effort that went into trying to get those Dayton Accords signed, get people who were absolutely intractable when it came to uh, working together. In fact, they were killing one another. You get to see why it is you do those tedious things day in and day out, why you suffer the insult, why you look the other way, or why you push harder. Uh, so it's important. That's what, and that's what we share. I mean, one of the things that I do really enjoy about uh, working in a legislative body is you find like-minded people, you share a goal, and it's a team sport. And it's more fun in life to try to solve problems than you just complain about them. That's sort of the existential part of it for me. Let's have a little fun, you know, getting this done. Senator, thank you. I hope everyone joins me in expressing our appreciation to Senator Welsh. Thank you.